All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the ransomware TTP changes that we've observed over the past couple of years. My name is Lindsay Kay. I'm the Senior Director of the Advanced Reversing Malware Operations and Reconnaissance Group at Insight Group Recorded Future. So I run the technical arm of our threat intelligence team, and by trade, I'm a malware analyst and reverse engineer. So we have to start by the premise that, just like every one of us, ransomware groups are also subject to the realities of the economy. And as a result, we see many of them innovate their tools or behavior because they want to remain successful in a very competitive market. It's not that they can just build it and the affiliates will come. But like some other innovations that didn't quite go as planned, sometimes these changes don't work out the way the threat actors intended, and sometimes we actually see them backfire. So today, I'm going to tell you about some of the innovations that we've observed in ransomware and talk about what made them either highly successful or less so. So over the past couple of years, there are kind of a couple of different categories of ways that we've seen um, lockers evolve and the ransomware actor TDPs change for a variety of threat actors. So things like new lockers spin up and spin down. We see feature additions to some of the existing ones. Um, there have been new ways of deploying and spreading them. Um, it's not also just C and C++ anymore, which we were used to a couple of years ago. Now we've seen languages like Golang, Rust, and Python as well. We've seen the use of additional extortion methods to really get people to pay. And we've also seen some threat actors target additional types of hardware. Some of them worked actually particularly well. So here's a couple of the categories. So first, the way that people deploy their lockers. So one of the things that we started seeing people move towards is using things like MSPs and other benign tools to start spreading them. So as you can imagine, rather than using a custom set of tools, now you have stuff that actually should be on the computers and within the organization. And that's a little bit harder to detect than something that's known malicious. Additionally, uh, kind of on the same vein, we've seen them do some more lateral movement using things like SMB shares, CIFS, and NFS. So effectively using the way that the computers operate against them. And then finally, what we've seen is some threat actors, like Alpha and some others, start building impersonation tokens into the locker to allow them to spread the, or allow the locker to spread itself. Additionally, the optimization of some of their current offerings. So a lot of people are using intermittent encryption because they want to make Lockers faster, faster is better, more damage, and more profit. And adding additional functionality to lockers based on affiliate demand and kind of like looking at what other people have. And, you know, ultimately you want to attract people. Additionally, seeing people fill the gaps in the ecosystem. So one kind of really well-known example here would be Black Matter and Conti coming out with a Linux and ESXi locker after Revil and DarkSide disbanded. And there weren't really any of those offerings out there. Additionally, using alpha, uh, looking at Alpha's addition of the chat access code to prevent chat hijacking, which I'll talk about later. They also have a victim files index site. So being able to search uh, the victim's files and see, it, see them more easily makes it easier for other threat actors to kind of look around. And then finally, making their panels more user friendly. So how can that hurt? So adding things like Bitcoin mixers, um, letting affiliates put in support tickets if they, something's broken or their features or things like that, and then helping them moderate their victims. Additionally, really trying to make the victims pay. So we've seen some additional uh, extortion techniques. So things like DDoSing victims who won't pay, um, calling their board members, their customers, clients, things like that, and contacting the media to really kind of make it way more well known that something bad has happened. And I know we all think it's kind of amusing, but printing the ransomware notes to actual physical printers has kind of a an incentivization purpose as well. So it's much harder to hide a ransomware attack from uh, the employees, if it's coming, if the ransom note's coming out of all the printers rather than just appearing on a couple of people's screens. So some things actually led something to be desired. So I know as like developers, we often say like, don't roll your own crypto. No, seriously, really don't. Um, Darkside and Black Matter both had encryption flaws that made people um, not have to pay the ransom to decrypt. Very bad for business. We've seen several actors in the like past year or so um, really try to do that false flag attribution thing. So I'll talk more about these, but a couple of groups include Lockbit, um, Zing, Xiao Ransomware, and then a couple other things that kind of came along with that. Sometimes you see some threat actors try to make their uh, malware harder to reverse engineer, but kind of as an artifact of it, make it more signatureable. So I'll talk a little bit about the Alphamorph Linux variant, um, Lockbit Black, and then everybody else using the leaked Black Matter code, and then the use of automated obfuscation like Play and Alpha did. Additionally, making your tool so secure that nobody can actually use it, also not great for business. So you can see on um, the right, uh, part of the um, panel to get into 
um, to get into the affiliate panel. So it required a Tor private key, which is significantly more challenging to implement than not. So harder to, harder to do. And then finally, when you let politics get involved. So Conti sided with Russia in the Russia-Ukraine invasion, and we'll talk about what happened after. So in kind of the spirit of Dua Lipa, I'm going to talk a little bit about the new rules of being a successful ransomware threat actor in this day and age. So first, play ransomware. So in case you're not familiar, play is a relatively new but fairly active ransomware variant that we first observed in June 2022. Like many kind of more traditional ransomware uh, variants, it's written in C++ and was first used in August 2022 against the Argentina Corte Cordoba, and then you can see some of their other victims there. Some of the notable features include, so the minimal ransom note. So if you've ever seen kind of a ransom note before, usually there's a lot of verbiage of who did it, what happens if you don't pay, very um, detailed instructions of how to pay. Um, you can see on the bottom, on the right, the play ransom note. So very minimal, just says play and gives you an email to contact. Additionally, we'll talk about their addition of um, return to programming and other added obfuscations and intermittent encryption. Yeah. So I really did say ROP and ransomware. So in case you're not super familiar with how return-oriented programming works, um, effectively it takes uh, advantage of the uh, how the RET instruction works. So you can see on the right, you have you increment stack pointer, then you do a return. Effectively what happens is this causes a jump to the real code, which you can see on the bottom. So this is kind of how play implemented their return-oriented programming, which effectively makes it harder to both statically and dynamically reverse engineer. Not impossible, but that's what it looks like. And then they have a bunch of kind of garbage code bytes. So it makes it a little bit harder for Kedra to kind of figure out what's going on. And a little bit of manual fix up is required. So you can see on the left, um, before play added the ROP, um, what their code looked like. So pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand, but that should give you some idea of what the difference is. So if you're a threat actor, adding obfuscation is great, but definitely consider doing it from the start. So the first play sample that we looked at um, was from about mid-June 2022. So it had a couple things, so string obfuscation. So you can see on the top right uh, an example of the string obfuscation. Not wildly challenging, but that's kind of the algorithm that they used. They also had an API hashing technique, so making it a little bit more challenging to do some of the static reverse engineering. But ultimately, outside of these two things, pretty easy to reverse engineer and pretty straightforward. So the additional obfuscations first came in in August 2022. So like I mentioned, the wrap, and then they also started doing some garbage code insertion. So you can see an example of the garbage code insertion. So really what this just functions to do is do nothing um, and or nothing of use really, and just make it more like you have to look at more stuff. So that's what the automated code insertion looks like. So while wrap is definitely a, posi a positive addition for them to have made and makes the code uh, effectively harder to reverse engineer, it's notable that the underlying functionality really didn't change. So if you reverse engineer an unobfuscated one, which is pretty easy to find on the internet, then it really kind of gives you an idea of what you're looking for. In the second one, it's easy to match up. Additionally, looking at that automated garbage code insertion, um, it was actually pretty signatureable. So I was able to write a signature um, looking for how they did that, so to find other copies. So if you're trying to make your malware less signatureable, not really super successful. So additionally, if you're a threat actor, you really want to kind of give the people what they want. So intermittent encryption um, is something that Play implements. And what we've seen is that, like some other threat actors, they'll encrypt every other one megabyte of data. So this is something that they introduced in June 2022. So it's been there from the beginning. And the reason you want to be able to do this is because you want to encrypt as much as you can as fast as you can. So as you can imagine, if you're conducting a ransomware attack, the more you can encrypt, the quicker you can encrypt before somebody figures out what you're doing and stops you, the better. So more damage, more likely to pay. So doing it this way also makes it less recoverable than just encrypting the first however many bytes. So some threat actors would encrypt the first, let's say, 10 megabytes and then just leave the rest of the file. Great on small files, not so great on files that are like five, six, seven gigs because more data to recover. Um, other threat actor groups are also implementing this. So some very well-known ones like Agenda, Alpha, and Black Bass, to name a few. And you can see what the um, intermittent encryption looks like at kind of the file perspective. So speaking of Alpha, um, they're rebranded Black Matter. So back in the day, we had Darkseid. They attacked Colonial Pipeline, um, got a lot of law enforcement attention because that was 
very bad. So the group ultimately disbanded because there was too much attention on them. Later, they rearranged as Black Matter, who had some decryption issues of their ransomware. So people weren't having to pay the ransom to uh, get their files decrypted. Not great for business either. So we later saw them pop back up as Alpha. And we first started to see some of their ransomware in December 2021. So they're known for a lot of their um, attacks on infrastructure. So Colonial Pipeline, as I mentioned, is dark side, as well as some other ones that you can see listed there. So some of their notable features here that I'll talk about is that they were the first big ransomware variant that was written in Rust. They were the first big ransomware variant with an ARM locker kind of mainstream. And they have this thing called the Build Time Obfuscation Toolkit Morph that I'll talk about as well. Use chat access tokens and then the Alpha Collections blog. So the searchable vi victim um, files index. So access tokens. So another thing that happened when the group was known as Black Matter is researchers happened to find a copy of their ransomware, virus total or the internet or something. They looked at the victim portal link, first engineered it, clicked on it and accessed it. So the problem was there was an active victim negotiation at that time. And then Everybody from the internet also joined in on that negotiation, which was very frustrating, upsetting to the threat actor. So at this point, uh, the victim chat was useless. They couldn't negotiate, figure out who the victim was. So as a result, they had to close it down and then try and figure out who the real victim was. So they required the, vi the actual victim to provide domain controller names and domain admin names in order to kind of restart the negotiation. But obviously, this isn't great. So... When the group popped back up as alpha, they implemented something called the access token as a locker parameter. So at build time, when you build your uh, copy as an affiliate, you get a, an access token. So your particular binary and your access token. And what this does is when you run the ransomware, you have to provide that proper access token to generate the correct victim link. So you can run it with kind of any access token, but you won't get to the right link. So unless you have both pieces, uh, it, this prevents researchers from being able to, you know, find your ransomware on the internet and then also do the same thing that happened before. So effectively, now you're creating a more secure line of communication with your victims. Um, you can't just find the victim page through sample detonation. So Rust. So this, again, is the first big ransomware written in Rust. So Previously, we would generally saw things like C, C++. Sometimes you'll see Delphi. Often you'll see Golang lately. Um, Ficker Stealer is written in Rust as well. Pretty popular stealer. But in terms of ransomware, that was kind of really it at the time. So part of the benefit of using Rust is that it's cross-compilable. So you write one set of code, and then you can get out of it a Windows, Linux, and ARM locker, which is pretty good. And as a bonus, uh, what I'm very familiar with is that reverse engineering at the time was significantly more challenging for a couple of reasons. So library functions, um, it's not always apparent that it is a library function. So sometimes they'll look like non-library interesting code. So if you're trying to reverse engineer a very large binary, which generally the Rust ones are, and you're trying to find kind of the interesting stuff to look at, it's a little more complicated than like C, C++, stuff like that. Additionally, you'll see a lot of the runtime code in the binary. So things like error handling. So if you can see in the top image, you see kind of the code, and then you see a lot of that um, error handling code in that. So what it functions to do is just make a binary kind of bigger, more stuff to look at, and you have to kind of scroll through it and kind of ignore that um, as you start doing reverse engineering. Additionally, if you're familiar with Golang, um, like Golang, the strings are not null terminated. So what this does is you can see in the bottom image here, so it runs them all together, requires some kind of pre-processing, uh, like fix up that you have to do to start figuring out where all the strings go. And kind of on that same vein, right now, the fix up tools are significantly more nascent than if Golang. So when Golang started being a big thing, um, didn't really have a lot of fix up tools. So we're kind of in that stage with Rust. So yeah, continuing, I did in fact say an arm locker. So the way that the group advertises this is that you can use this to target different NAS devices. So QNAP, Synology, and other ones like that. Um, it's meant to be used in parallel to your Windows and Linux and ESXi lockers. So obviously you can lock Windows systems or Linux and ESXi ones where people might host a lot of their um, infrastructure, things like that. But now you can also go after their backups and uncommon file share types. So really what this, the purpose of this is to increase the ultimate effectiveness of a ransomware attack. So obviously the more you can encrypt, the less kind of recoverable it is for the company. And 
Previously, if you weren't able to encrypt kind of their backups and uncommon file shares, now you are. So that's kind of a, one more sort of safety net the company might have had that now don't have anymore. So to date, I haven't really seen it used in the wild at all. Um, that's not to say that it won't be, but so far so, that's where we are. Um, and ultimately, though, arm lockers really aren't super common to see, um, especially not by like big ransomware groups. So Chaos Ransomware and some other groups also have one, but in terms of kind of those big names, um, this is the first one we've seen. So moving on to Alphamorph. So Alphamorph was advertised as an obfuscation toolkit. So both for their Windows and their Linux. So the way that they advertised it is it will help the malware evade AV detection um, kind of the, through the automated obfuscation of strings and garbage code addition. So as promised, the Windows version did in fact have string obfuscation. So the way that they do it is it is a very simple one byte XOR. So randomly chosen single byte um, and then randomly generated code to deobfuscate it. So you can see on the left, um, the deobfuscation function for the strings. The, really the only kind of salient point is the XORing of value with eight, uh, the rest of it's garbage code. So when you kind of look at alpha morph generated files in general, what you'll see is you'll see like a lot of like global kind of arithmetic operations that have no purpose and you can kind of see some of them there. So generally what their garbage code insertion looks like. Another thing that's notable about the Windows um, morph obfuscation is that the binaries were now over four times the size of their unobfuscated versions. So the rest binaries are actually pretty big, right? They're about three megabytes and the obfuscated versions were about 14, so significantly bigger. And most of the um, size increase was in the text, data, and relocation section, primarily because of how, I guess, this obfuscation does work. So that's where the biggest increases are. So, it's really important as a threat actor, though, to check your work. So they also offered it for their Linux and ESXi builds. So looking at it, um, didn't actually see any string obfuscation at all. So that was not as promised. However, if you look at the Linux x64 morph obfuscated samples, now what you see is like, if you're familiar with the, com uh, the concept of name mangling, you start to see instead of kind of the scrub names, you start to see like versions of sort of name mangled function names. So you can see on the left, for the unobfuscated Linux versions, um, functions don't have any names with the word locker in it. Um, those are all the exported variables, nothing kind of untoward or that really gives you some idea of what this is doing. However, if you look on the right, um, you can see the obfuscated x64 Linux and ASXi samples. So you start to see some of those function names kind of coming out, which if you do reverse engineering, you're like, yes, now I can start figuring out what's going on. Function names are very helpful, but very rarely seen. So you start to see like some of the locker core kind of concept stuff. And you start to see in the 32-bit um, samples, the exported variables from the obfuscated ones, you can start to see some of that similar name mangling. So they no longer offer this, uh, not entirely sure why, but so it's not available anymore. But yeah, no, really checking your work is actually super important um, if you are going to build a locker, especially. So something that we've seen is that fully testing the encryption and decryption, while very critical, um, there have been several mistakes over the past couple of years. So again, this is something to check because that's how you make money, encrypting people's files. So a very kind of recent example, if everybody remembers the ESXi args from like a month ago, uh, the first version, what they were doing is they were, again, using intermittent encryption. However, they would encrypt one megabyte and then skip X based on some calculation that determined that X is approximately 1% of the file size. So great, again, if the file's small, but if you have a 450 gigabyte like VM image, let's say, um, which might be on ESXi, um, you'd encrypt one megabyte, skip about four and a half gigs, and then encrypt one megabyte. So what happened is this made it recovery possible for those very large files because it was so small the amount that they were encrypting at a time. Version two actually fixed this bug. Next, Luna Ransomware. So they had an ESXi locker in about 2022. And generally, if you look at ESXi lockers, what happens is they find all the VMs, they will shut them down, and then they will encrypt them. So what Luna did is they did not do this. They just encrypted them without shutting them down, which as you're probably familiar with, might mean that when you try to decrypt them, they are now corrupted. Also very bad for business if you're not actually encrypting people's files after you've made them pay and you promised to do so. Next, uh, Black Matter and Darkseid, I alluded to this before. So um, because they decided to roll their own crypto, 
Um, what this meant is that there was a cryptographic flaw that allowed researchers to help decrypt some of their victims without payment. So obviously super embarrassing. Um, in addition to some of the other stuff that happened to Black Matter, ultimately led to them rebranding as Alpha. And then finally, root ransomware in about 2019. So they had a buggy decryptor that didn't work on large files. Again, also bad for business. So um, this is definitely something that, well, not like a super big trend, keeps happening. So potentially in the future, as ransomware actors keep writing their lockers, um, something that we expect to maybe see in the future. So moving on to LockBit. So they're one of the most active ransomware groups today. So their original version was written in Origin C, and they've been around since September 2019. So here's a couple of their victims, uh, but they've had many over the past four years. So some of their notable features are SteelBit, the automated data exfiltration tool, the recruiting of insiders. So we haven't seen other victim, other ransomware groups do this, but they were offering um, money, payment, jobs to people who are in organizations to provide initial access to that organization. So if you provide a way in for LockBit to your organization, they'll pay you. It's not something we've seen other people do. And additionally, I'll talk about what happened when their builder got leaked. So um, after Black Matter fired all the developers after all the decryption issues and then got the new guy who writes Rust, um, LockBit seems to have acquired the code. So this spun up a variant of LockBit called LockBit Black. Um, rumor has it though, after um, the developer who was hired or the code um, was used, uh, was disgruntled for whatever reason. And then he then leaked some LockBit Black code. So what this now means, this is available to anybody who wants it. And because it has a customizable configuration, anybody can actually modify it. So now we start seeing some ransomware group spinoffs, such as Bloody Ransomware, who can now use this um, pretty easily. Kind of in a similar vein, uh, the most recent sort of LockBit variant that we've seen is called LockBit Green. Um, so Conti's leaked source code by the Ukrainian researcher. Now looks like LockBit acquired it and then built their own variant. Um, so the reason we think that this is now not Conti, right, is there's a new ESXi variant for it. And looking at some of the Tor-based URLs in LockBit samples, um, they belong to LockBit, not Conti. So now there's kind of three major variants, green, black, and original. So looking at LockBit Black, so I looked substantially at Black Matter Ransomware. So when LockBit Black came out, I was very curious. So here are both of the entry functions. So LockBit Black looked, at least from the outset, very much like Black Matter Ransomware. So you can kind of see, pretty similar. The only kind of really big salient difference is the do decrypt in LockBit at the top, which I'll talk about. But this wasn't all of it. So if you're an aspiring threat actor, totally fine to borrow other people's code and definitely find opportunities for improvement where you can. So there are other similarities there too. So kind of outside just that entry function, the high level structure of the code was extremely similar. Um, the API hashing technique that they used, their string hashing for the command line options. So you can see what that looks like. Um, the string hash is on the top. So instead of saying, comparing like an ASCII string to an ASCII string to whatever came in, what they do is they hash the string that they're looking for and hash the input, um, compare those. So it just makes it a little more challenging to statically reverse engineer because then you have to figure out all your different options there. Um, the configuration file decryption also um, pretty much the same as some of the newer versions of Black Matter. And then finally, um, the anti-debugging techniques and the combination thereof that they used. So one kind of well-known example is the crash if a breakpoint is placed on the thread. So there are some differences as well. So some of the Locket Black versions require password to decrypt. So if you don't provide the right password, can't decrypt, won't run. So other groups have done this in the past. Um, a Gregor, kind of a well-known one, but some of these versions require that. In addition, they started accepting additional command line parameters. So adding additional functionality that you as an affiliate can use to run the ransomware. So a couple examples are the group policy modification and self-deletion. So you can see on the bottom um, the lock bit black kind of program command line argument parsing. So you can see some of those additional options there. Structure very, very similar to how Black Matter did it, but now with these additional options. You can see that string comparison or the um, hash comparison as well. And then finally, um, the configuration data flags. So in response to kind of this additional functionality, there were some additional configuration data flags that were required.
So those also appeared. So also consider keeping on improving. So after the release of Lockpick Black and I guess Lockpick Green, um, they've been actually pretty consistent. Um, so we don't see as much change over time in kind of that original loggers, other groups. So maybe their MO is going to be acquiring other kind of leaked code and building variants from that. It's unclear right now. Um, so as I alluded to, some of the samples had the requirement of the decrypt function. Um, some of the newer ones don't. Uh, this seems like to be like a builder option, so you can choose to include it or not include it. So we'll probably continue to see both. Uh, like I mentioned, Egregor used the password-based decryption of their malware pretty successfully. So it was hard enough to find kind of an Egregor sample that you could reverse engineer because you also have, the correct pa have to have the correct password or you can't decrypt it. So if you're trying to prevent people from reverse engineering your actual kind of ransomware, kind of a useful feature. And as a bonus, I mentioned Steelbit. So a lot of ransomware groups, obviously to extort their victims, want to take victim files and exfiltrate them so they can use them in the extortion process. So Lockbit has something called Steelbit. So it just automates the data exfiltration uh, process of the victim files, and then it uploads them to the leak site for the affiliate. Very handy. So I also talked a little bit about something that was false flag. So Lockbit is one of the groups that does this. So when Recorded Future interviewed them, Lockbit advised they definitely live in China. None of their affiliates live in the United States or Russia. So the concerns that we were raising to them about, you know, for people who live in Russia, uh, the U.S. and stuff, definitely did not apply to them. Um, we also see some threat actors kind of try and do or kind of false flag as China-based or China-associated threat actors. Um, you'll see them post some machine-translated Chinese uh, ask about ransomware. So you can see on the bottom here an example of the post. So I don't read Chinese, but I talked to one of my coworkers who does, and he advises it's definitely not correct. So this gives you some idea of kind of what you're looking at uh, for when I'm talking about that. So a forum, RAMP, also welcomes Chinese speakers. So they're trying to attack attract some Chinese threat actors and ransomware gangs. Not entirely sure why, but that's kind of what uh, it looks like on the bottom left. So um, sometimes this just doesn't work out. They don't really super false flag very effectively in general. So Yan Lu Wang uh, was a ransomware group purporting to be China associated. But what happened is that some of the chats belonging to them, their group were leaked. So they were not in fact Chinese and all the chats were in Russian. So they were Russian speakers. So kind of one great way to reveal yourself. But we can sometimes also see it in their code. So for example, I looked at something that purported to be Xiao ransomware. Great. Drops this note. Um, doesn't explicitly call out uh, being China, China associated, but that was some kind of some of the form and branding and stuff like that. But you can kind of see the note there. So looking at where I ran it, um, looking at the command line output, you can see that it says Revix 1.1. So back in the day, when Revil was still kind of very active in their sort of original form, they had a Linux locker called Revix. Um, so it had the exact same kind of printout. I recognize that it was a little confused. So obviously this is not shall. It seems like they just kind of reskinned the original Revix, suggesting maybe they acquired the code or maybe related actors. So talked a lot about all these changes and um, we as kind of defenders want to hunt them. So kind of the way that I would advise is face the strange, right? So looking at for what's weird or kind of what's unique or kind of interesting and fun about a lot of this stuff is kind of a great way to track them. So as I mentioned, some of the automated obfuscation techniques, they'll often leave artifacts. So like play and alpha, um, maybe they were custom, maybe they weren't, but this automated way of doing it allows you to start creating signatures to look for other versions. Maybe other people are using that same technique um, to start kind of looking for other variants there as well. While it is better if they're custom, because that kind of is more group associated, still pretty entertaining to find other people using that same technique. Also looking for inconsistencies in some language or strings. So especially their ransom notes. So agenda, for example, purported to have a Linux version. Um, hadn't really seen it published on in the wild extensively, so I wanted to find one. So what we did was we looked in the ransom note. There was kind of some weird verbiage and sort of misspellings. Being able to sort of pivot off that allowed us to find one, which was really cool. Um, also looking at some of the anti-debugging, anti-analysis, and anti-RE techniques, not necessarily just kind of in 
an individual, but sometimes the combination thereof. So if they use an, a, enough um, combination of them and like kind of custom ones, especially like the string obfuscations generally seem to be pretty unique. That's a good way to start finding other ones. Um, the implementation of the crypto algorithms. So one of the things that Black Matter and DarkSide did was they had kind of a strange combination of crypto algorithms that were only really seen before. Um, so the one in Black Matter was only seen necessarily before in DarkSide. Kind of a good way to start looking at some of that overlap there. Any other buggy anomalies? So code that should work that doesn't. Um, code that doesn't really do anything, but looks like it should do something that they just... I guess, left in there and doesn't really have any effect. So kind of some fun things to track there. Um, and being able to stay up on the latest affiliate news. So um, you can see Alpha's announcement of Morph, right? So you start to get an idea of like, okay, they've come out with this new thing. Let me start looking for it. Let me figure out how to get it and signature it. So to kind of get an idea of kind of what's coming out now. And if you want to start looking for some of the similarities, um, like I mentioned, a lot of these builders are leaked. Some are improved upon, some are not. So looking for code reuse between families. So if there's a leaked builder and you're trying to look for other groups that may be using this builder, being able to signature for that and start mapping that out that way. And also, if you're trying to look for ransomware, maybe some not super huge ones or kind of newer variants, being able to look for some of that ransom note language, it's all pretty common, I would say. So things like what happened, your network and Tor project are a couple examples there. And with that, thank you so much. Any questions? So there's a couple different ones that they use for initial access. So obviously phishing is super popular. So they will also look to do some sort of exploitation of like some of the internet facing services. So with the whole move a couple of years ago to everybody starting to work from home with the pandemic, we saw a lot of people exploiting vulnerabilities for those kind of like uh, perimeter type devices and any of the remote work tools as well. Uh, but yeah, phishing is really popular. I'm going to say it's very effective. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you so much.